Amen. Praise the Lord. And you know, uh, we are in the month of November, and how quickly a year has passed by. Amen. And uh, really excited. Um, I always look forward towards the end of the year, and um, and I think that if we know how to master our time well, um, the end of the year is um, a really good time for us to um, connect with the people that we really love, our families, and of course there's Christmas that's coming, and our school holidays are coming as well for the kids, and our family starts traveling. I think we've got quite a lot of people who are already traveling and enjoying uh, the vacations, and again, we want to encourage you all to do that. It's so precious to be able to have time with family and to hang out with family. Amen. And um, yeah, but this week, I want to talk about uh, communion, about celebrating the Lord's table. And again, in the month of November, we've got three weeks where we're just going to talk about some simple, basic doctrinal uh, matters. And we want to talk about these things because, you know, as we come together as a new church, we've got people coming from all very different uh, streams and, um, you know, traditions. And so there is a level of uh, equalization, there's a level of, you know, coming together in agreement in what we believe here in Life Church and how we want to go about doing certain things. And also we want to help us understand some of these things that we do. And I think that growing up in church, uh, you know, as a Christian, uh, you know, there's always this element of practicing communion, having communion, you know. But I, I don't think that I've ever heard a message uh, preached or taught about communion in itself. You know, every, uh, most times in a communion service, there's some, you know, um, type of little explanation, but not really into the theology of what we believe. And I hope that today, this evening, as we do these things, as we talk about these things, right, it will really give us a sense of a deeper understanding about what communion and the Lord's table is all about, what is, you know, the history of communion and how, you know, it developed over the centuries and what we have today. And I hope also that we can somehow rediscover the original intention of the Lord when He instituted uh, the Lord's table and how we can uh, um, learn to practice this a little bit more regularly in our gatherings together. Amen. Now, communion is, is, is really a, an essential centerpiece of the Christian gathering ever since the Lord instituted it on the night that He was betrayed, right? Now, in the Old Testament, there was already a foreshadowing of the Lord's table, and this is essentially the Passover, the Feast of Passover, and it is a meal that the Jewish people would celebrate. In fact, it is this same meal, the Passover meal, that Jesus and His disciples were participating in, during which the Lord instituted communion um, uh, and established it. Okay? It was during the Passover meal. And it was at this meal that the Lord took the bread, He took the cup, and He gave them as the elements of the Lord's table in the New Covenant, the bread representing His body and the cup representing His blood in the New Covenant. And so this weekend, we want to dive into these uh, two aspects a little bit. And this is something that as Christians we are very familiar with, and again, I mentioned this, that we might not be aware of the doctrinal issues or the development of the communion service to what it is uh, or what we have or what we experience today. I, I think it's interesting for me to begin this by talking a little bit about the history of communion, right? Incidentally, I think the word communion actually doesn't appear in Scripture, right? It does not, okay? And many times it's, uh, you know, uh, the mention of it speaks about the breaking of bread amongst the believers. We talk about the Lord's table, yeah, but the word communion is not... Uh, found in Scripture, but we are going to stick to it just because people understand what this word means, right? And now, but to look at the history of communion, you see, in the Gospels, we have a record of the institution of communion. And this happened in a night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed. And I want to look at this by considering Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to verse 20, okay? So I got the verses out. We're going to read this together. So uh, tag along with me. It says this in verse 14, when the hour had come, he sat down, Jesus sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So the meal that they were going to partake of was the Passover meal. Okay? And then the Lord said, For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. 
Okay? And then it says, Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Now, let me just give you a little outline of what is my approximation of what happened at the Passover meal. Now, you've got to understand the Passover meal in the days where Jesus celebrated it might look a little bit different from the cedar meal that is being practiced today amongst the Jewish people, right? The Passover meal today is called the cedar meal. The word cedar means order. And so there's an order to how this meal is conducted. But this is my approximation, okay? So first thing, if you look at the slides I'll give to you, as the, as the families come together for the Passover meal, the first thing they do is they prepare the first cup of wine and they will mix this cup of wine with water. And this is called the cup of Kiddush or the cup of sanctification, right? And as this cup is prepared, the meal then is brought out and the meal will consist of unleavened bread, of a roasted lamb, bitter herbs, different sauces, and so on and so forth. Now, and of course, then they'll partake of the first cup, and, but it's not the meal per se. Now, before they begin the meal, they will have a second cup uh, of wine that is mixed, and this is called the cup of Haggadah or the cup of telling. At the mixing of this cup, the son will ask the father, why is this night special? Why is it different from all the rest of the nights that we have through the year? And the father will answer the son with Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 5 to 11, explaining about the exodus and the deliverance that God brought Israel out. And then the family will sing Psalms 113 and Psalms 114 together. And then the third cup will be mixed, and this is called the cup of Berekah or the cup of blessing. Now, before this cup is partaken, the meal then begins with the blessing and the eating of the matzah or the bread. Now, this eating of the bread is the bread that we have for communion. This is the point where the Lord takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and then they eat the bread. And after the bread is eaten and finished, then the meal begins, they eat the rest of the meal. When the meal is finished, the lamb is eaten, then the third cup is drunk. And this is the cup whereby the Lord says, this, is the, my, this, is, this represents my blood that is shed for you. This is uh, my blood of the new covenant, okay? And then they will sing Psalms 115 to Psalms 118. And this is what is recorded for us in the Gospel of Mark of the hymns that they sung. And then finally, the fourth cup is prepared and drunk. And this is the cup of Hallel or the cup of praise. And then there are different other practices that goes along thereafter, okay? Incidentally, there's a fifth cup that is also mentioned uh, in, the, in the cedar meal. And this cup is not drunk. There's one cup left for Elijah because they believe Elijah will come back before the Messiah comes back, okay? But in technicality, this is what it was. And this is how the meal was situated. What actually happened, what we read in, uh, in Luke chapter uh, 22, this is the sequence or as approximation of the sequence of what happens. Now, You've got to understand this. Communion in the New Testament was practiced very much as a meal and not as a service. So as they celebrate a Passover and Jesus established this is as, a, as, as something that the church would begin to do, the church began to practice this meal on a regular basis, okay? I want to show you several scriptures in the New Testament that talks about the church doing this meal. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we are told that the church, that the newborn church, this is what they did. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread. Now, this is where the meal happens. And then in prayers. Now, again, in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, a few verses after that, it says again, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread. Now, that's, that's the meal. From house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Now, Acts chapter 20, verse 70 is also a famous passage. Of course, this passage, we remember it because Paul preached so long that the boy fell asleep and fell off from the window, right? You remember that account? And then they had to raise the boy up from the dead, right? So please don't fall asleep today. Um, but essentially, this verse, in verse 7, says this, Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples gathered together to break bread. Now, the first day of the week is not Monday. 
Okay? It's not Monday. But they gathered together, they broke bread. Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Okay? That's where the guy fell asleep and fell out the window. Okay? And so, of course, this is the meal that they talked about. So, from these passages, what is clear is that communion was regularly practiced as part of an evening meal amongst Christians at homes, in homes. It was something that was done corporately. It was not something that was done individually. So once a week, the church would come together, right? And they will have meals from home to home. And in the midst of the meal, they will practice communion. So communion was embedded in a meal that the Christians would have together. You know what we we can do later? Stay tonight at the end of the service. We're going to have the tables out. We're going to get you guys to, you know, buy, um, buy your food, then come up. When you come up, When your table is full, then you eat together. We'll pass our communion elements. Before you eat your meal, as a table, have communion. Because when you do that, you're going to approximate more towards how the New Testament actually practiced the communion. So the communion was never a service in the New Testament text of our scriptures. Then what happened after that? You see, as early as the first century, after you know, the church was born and the apostles had, had, had uh, died and, you know, the, the, this communion then began to transform and it transformed from being a meal, you know, that was something that the, the people would do into a part of the Christian order of service, right? There are several reasons why this happened. I'm not going to dive into it, you know, and, um, but it is noted that at this point, in this early, in, 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 in 100 uh, AD, 100 plus AD, the first time we begin to read that there is a requirement for water baptism that began to appear for, one, for a person to participate in communion as a service. And then we discover from early writings then that the, there's a development of liturgy also that also began to appear as well for how a communion service was to be conducted. For the first time, it was begin, they began to designate who may conduct communion services. And they began to restrict who are the ones who are allowed to conduct a communion service, right? Then from 200 to 500 uh, century, you know, the 2nd to the 5th century, there were further restrictions that began to be added to communion one after another. This is where the church began to require confirmation as well as confession, right? You've got to become a part of the institutional church. There has to be a confirmation. You have to come for confession, And throughout this period, Christianity began to move away from being practiced in homes, right, to a place where Christianity became a faith that would be practiced in cathedrals, in churches. They began to build buildings, places of worship, and the whole flavor of Christianity began to change. And then during the medieval times, the church was split. If you didn't know this, it was split between the Western church and the Eastern church, in which you have the Roman Catholic church, and then you have the Eastern Orthodox church. And then they began to change the language. So Christianity began to be practiced in specific languages and each of these churches adopted different languages and service, communion services had to be conducted in those languages. Unfortunately, the issue is this. The people, the common people, didn't understand the language. So you come for communion service. Can you imagine? And I will be speaking some language. Ooh, blah, 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 don't know. <laughs> and all, you wouldn't understand a single thing. And then you just take communion, right? And that's what it became. It became. It wasn't until the Reformation that happened in the 16th century, in the 1500s, okay, where there then is a recovery of scriptural instructions on the communion and what is supposed to be the what is the communion supposed to be. Now, as we reach this point of history, I want to segue nicely into the next part about communion, which is the doctrine or the teaching of communion. You see, when you consider communion, it is tied, the doctrine of communion, what the church teaches about is tied to the history of the church. So there are four main views about what communion is. Four main views. The first is a big word. It's called transubstantiation. And this is essentially a a Roman Catholic view of communion, and they call it the Eucharist. Now, this view is held mainly by the Roman Catholics, and it holds that during Mass, the bread and the cup literally transforms and becomes the body and the blood of Jesus. So it's no longer a piece of bread, it's no longer a cup of wine, it is literally the body and the blood of Jesus. 
And hence, there is a recapitulation of the offering of Christ. Right? So every time this happens, the offering of Christ is being made. Now, this view is largely rejected during the time of the Reformation. And part of the Reformation was to deal with some of these views. You see, the worshipful adoration of the elements of the bread and the cup was considered by the Reformers as idolatry. And the recapitulation of the sacrifice of Jesus undermines the fact that Jesus' death on the cross was final and that was sufficient of, uh, you know, uh, of what God has done on the cross. We don't need to crucify Jesus every time. You understand? Right? So basically, with the Reformation, the church came to understanding that this is a wrong doctrine concerning communion. Now, then there's another view called the consubstantiation, and this is largely a Lutheran view. This view was held by Martin Luther, the reformer, and it continues to be the view of many Lutherans today. Martin Luther wanted to correct the error of transubstantiation, but at the same time, wanted to take with seriousness Jesus' identification with the elements of the communion. So he says that the elements do not literally become the flesh and the blood of Jesus, but the substance of the Lord's body and the substance of the Lord's blood are present together with the bread and the wine. Therefore, the word corn, together with. Right? So it's only a slight differentiation from transubstantiation. The third view is the memorial view, and this is a largely Baptist view. And this view originated from the Swiss reformer called Zwigli, and uh, this is the view of most Baptists today. The view here is that in fact, this is not just the view of the, of the Baptists, it's the view of most of the, the spirit-filled people, the Pentecostals. This is the general view uh, of the greater part of the body of Christ. And the view here is that the elements are purely symbolic of the body and the blood of Jesus, meaning when you hold the bread and the cup, they are 100% symbols of the Lord's body and His blood. After all, Jesus, at some point in the Gospel, in John 10, 7, He said, I am the door. In John 15, 5, he says, I am the vine. But he doesn't transform into a door. Neither does he transform into a vine, right? And in the same way, Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. Now, it is figurative, it is not literal. Zigri holds that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is once for all sufficient and complete. It's done, finished. Communion is a memorial meal to remind us of what Jesus has done for us. Every time we partake of communion, it's a looking back in remembrance of what Jesus has done, right? The fourth and final view is the spiritual presence view, which is a reform view. And this view stands from John Calvin and from his position comes actually a spectrum of views that varies in small ways from one another. John Calvin rejected the idea that there is a physical change to the blood in the cup, he also rejects the idea that communion is purely memorial. So at the Lord's table, Christ is present spiritually in a special way, but not in a physical way. As the church partakes of communion together, there's a true, there's a true spiritual communion that takes place. So John Calvin just took somewhere in between, okay? That's essentially what it is. Now, what do we believe here in Life Church? We have adopted and we believe in the memorial view of communion. That's our view. The reason is because Paul's most definitive instruction about communion are these words, remembrance, right? In, in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, 25, which we often read at communion, we say, the Lord says, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The power is not in the element of the bread and the cup. The power is in remembrance that as you hold the bread and the cup, you look back and you, and you remember the bread represents the broken body, the work of Jesus on the cross. And that's where the power springs from. Faith in what Jesus has done once and for all on the cross. Amen? Now, the next thing I want to tackle is what is the purpose of communion? What is the purpose of communion? You know, and as we come together what do we want to accomplish through communion? We come together to celebrate the Lord's table. Where should our focus be upon? There are five things that communion requires for us to do. The first is that communion requires for us to look back. This is remembrance. The call to remembrance of what Jesus has done for us is repeated multiple times in Luke chapter 22, 19, 1 Corinthians 11, 24, and 25. Central to the intention of communion is a remembrance of Jesus. So later, when we have food together, table by table, and we give out the communion elements, when you come together, it is to pause 
and to say that, hey, we are all unified by one thing, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. We pause for a moment before our meal and we remember Jesus and what He's done, right? And this is to look back. The second thing is to look inwards, which is to examine. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 28 calls us to examine ourselves. Jesus literally, literally said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 24. He says that we are to leave our gift at the altar and be reconciled with our brother first. Right? And that's uh, the essence of self-examination. Communion is an, is an opportunity given for us for quiet introspection, to pause. Oftentimes, you know, amongst those that we are having communion together, to pause. Right? Have you, husband and, and wife, have you ever had a quarrel? Then you sit down at the table and then you have to do communion and then you have to pause. Mmm, awkward. But isn't that good? Not to leave things the way they are, not to leave relationships fractured. Amen? Introspection. The third is to look around, and this is unity, because communion is meant to be done corporately. It is a real and evident reminder that though we are many members, we are one body. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 17 literally directs us during communion to consider this, that we are one body, right? It is also a reminder to set aside sectarianism and division within the church, as instructed again in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 17 to 22. In this case, where Paul was tackling this issue in the Corinth, in the Corinth church, there was a division of class. The rich were doing things to you know, that, that, that segregated the poor. And Paul says, stop this. Stop this division, right? So as we come together as a church, we celebrate, we need to look around. Hey, people around us are different, different upbringing, different background, perhaps different races, different age group, but we are one body. And that's essential for us to do. The fourth thing is to look, uh, sorry, uh, the fourth thing is to look forward. How many have I done? Right, okay. The fourth is to look forward, which is uh, um, hope. Okay, I think I missed one out. Did I miss one? Okay, sorry. Four things, okay? And, um, and it's to look forward, which is hope. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26 tells us this, that in, communi in communion, we proclaim the Lord's death till He returns. Amen. So even as we partake of communion, the Lord said this multiple times. He says that He will not partake of this meal again until He comes in the kingdom, right? And so when we partake of this, there is an expectation that God is, Christ is uh, abstaining from this meal until He returns. And when His return comes, we will be joined with Him and we will have this meal together with Him. Amen? So each time we have communion, we are proclaiming hope, we are proclaiming our expectation of the Lord's return. Now, the next part I want to talk about is the conduct of communion. How is communion to be conducted? What are some practical things that we need to understand? The first thing I want to mention is that it is corporate in nature. Now, scripturally speaking, communion is only ever mentioned from a corporate approach. There is not once in the Bible where communion is told to be done individually. Okay? This is in scripture. So, communion was never nestled in the context of somebody partaking of it individually, but it's always corporately. But we, want, we talked about this as a team, and we want to point out to us also that though it is not mentioned to be done individually, neither does the Scriptures, the Bible does not forbid us from doing it individually. So if you do it individually, the Bible does not say that it's a sin, right? And again, because we believe that communion is a memorial of what Jesus has done for us, we believe there's nothing wrong if we want to do communion as a personal practice in our life. So if you want to do this on your own every morning, right, then I want to suggest to you, please go ahead. And when you do it, remember this, the essence of communion is this introspection, it is remembrance, it is proclamation of what the Lord has done. The element of looking around that you can't do because you're doing it alone, right? But it is to remember what Jesus has done in your lives. But we, we also want to say this, okay, because sometimes we, people be, the, the church begins to teach this thing that, hey, communion is a means of divine health. 
And we begin to think that communion, those elements are like vitamins, you know, or you eat them, then you'll be healthy forever. Can I tell you this? You should still take your normal vitamins. <laughs> Can I also tell you this? That if you eat bad, you don't exercise, it doesn't matter how you do communion every day. Your irresponsibility in looking after your physical body cannot be compensated by, oh, I just take communion, I'll be well. Okay? Communion is not a means of an excuse for you to be irresponsible with your health. Okay? So don't treat communion like some magic pill. It is not a magic pill. The Bible teaches us it's for memorial. Amen? So do it correctly. So if you have communion on your own in the mornings, realize what it's meant to be. Pause, introspection, remember, right? The second thing about the practice of communion is that the requirement is that those who partake of it are, have faith in Jesus Christ, right? And here is another scriptural alignment that we want to make because in many um, denominations, water baptism, confirmation is a requirement before someone can partake in communion, Right? You know, if you come from some of the more traditional denominations, you will realize that this is the practice. Um, also, we want to say this, there is no such requirement in Scripture. There is nothing in Scripture that tells us that you need to be water baptized first before you can partake of communion. Okay? So the only requirement is that you must be in the faith. You must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Right? If you don't believe, then what's the point of communion for you? You're looking back at the cross for what? Right? For us, it's powerful because we believe in Jesus. We believe the cross is the turning point of everything including, included in our lives. So when we look back, there's power in it. Faith in the cross. Now, if you look back at your faith in the cross, you're pretty much a Christian. You're following Jesus, right? But can I also say this, that when you consider the Bible, okay, just as there's no requirement for water baptism before communion, in the Bible, when people get saved and born again, you know what they do immediately? They get water baptized. There's no delay. There's no waiting. Ah, ah, I just believe I don't want to get water baptized. No. The Bible records for us when Cornelius and his household in Acts chapter 10 got saved, immediately they got water baptized. Ethiopian eunuch whom Philip was teleported and he preached and explained the scriptures. He gets saved, he believes, and he says, look, there's water, what prevents me from being... And he gets water baptized. It was assumed, it was accepted that the moment you got saved, you get water baptized immediately, right? We're thinking about how to do this. We're thinking about how we can baptize people every week as soon as they get saved. I don't know if we can do that, you know? We might put a permanent pool outside. I don't know. Maybe someday we have a place where we can actually do that. We will always put a baptism pool every week. So anyone gets saved straight away, go get water baptized. Because that's biblical. Amen? It's an immediate response of faith in Jesus Christ. Right? That's what's biblical. We want to go back to the Bible. Amen? But it is so important, if there are people, if it is if anyone here, you're sitting in this place, you believe in Christ, but you're not yet water baptized, we want to get you water baptized. I don't know if we have a QR code or something like that. I think we prepared something like that. Yeah, okay. Scan the QR code. Yeah. Okay, sign up. Sign up. Okay. And as soon as we can, we'll organize something to get you guys water baptized. Is that okay? Is that okay? Right? It's good. Amen. So, number three, what about our children? Can they partake of communion? And this is a question that's asked concerning our younger children as to whether they can partake of communion. And our answer to you is yes. As Christian parents, our children are holy according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14. Right? If you're a Christian parent, your child is holy according to the instruction of Paul. Our job as parents is to raise our children up in the faith. You see, when we celebrate communion at home in our families, when we do so, I want to encourage you, do not exclude your young children from the communion table. Don't tell them, hey, you cannot eat. Tell them, hey, you can eat. 
But at the same time, we want to encourage you to take time to explain to the children the importance and the significance of communion to them. It is important that we teach them to partake the meal with reverence, with faith. You can teach your young children from, be- from a young age that, hey, this is what this represents. This is what Jesus did for us. So if you are sick, you can pray for healing because by, our, by His stripes, we are healed. You can teach them that, hey, if you made a mistake, you can ask for forgiveness and Jesus washes you clean. Amen? And that's the power. Explain these things to the children. Remember in the actual Passover meal, there is one particular cup whereby the sons will ask the fathers about the significance of Passover. Why do we do this? And then the fathers are to use this opportunity to explain to the children, this is why we do this, right? What is most important for us is please, the communion element is not a snack for the children. Okay? Do not let your children treat the communion elements like a before meal snack. Okay, don't let them treat. Explain to them. Pray with them. That's what parents are supposed to do, right? Teach them. Now, the fourth thing is we want all of us to learn how to conduct communion, okay? And, you know, in much of church history, only the clergy were allowed to con- conduct communion. And this is often because the church actually believes in transubstantiation or consubstantiation. And when you believe something like that, then the church began to say to the people, hey, because this is consecrated, this is the Lord's body, only the holy man of God, the consecrated man of God can touch it. Right? So it began to be segregated to only the clergy who can conduct communion. But as we realize that this is a memorial of what the Lord has done, then we all may learn to conduct communion. This is, because this is exactly what happened in the New Testament church. In Acts, they met from house to house breaking bread, and before the meal, they had communion. So this is what we want all of us to learn how to do. And remembering that, hey, communion is about looking back, right? Looking inwards, looking around, right? And then looking forward to what the Lord uh, is going to do, what, that He's returning. And, and I want to encourage us, especially if you are you, your parents and you have children at home, learn to do this. Learn to do this. You know, um, when, when I began to study this, it really, really opened my eyes in a fresh way. So um, we had live group, and uh, two live groups ago, like, you know, three, three Wednesdays ago, I decided, hey, for my life group, we're going to have communion as part of the meal. So we tried it out. So we, we, we sat down, the food is all laid out, we passed around the communion elements, and we said, hey, we're going to make this a part of the meal. Right? So before the meal starts, let's have communion. And so we, we took the bread, we gave thanks, we partook of it, we took time to remember the Lord, what He's done for us, we took time to love one another, consider one another, and then after that, we had the meal. And, you know, I want to encourage us because I think that there is a power of communion that has been lost in the church over the history of the church. And I really believe God wants us to recover the power of it. Right? The power of remembrance, the power of looking around, introspection, of considering one another, the power of communion to bring reconciliation amongst ourselves. Right? So I don't know if we can do that. We have communion elements. So if you want to, at the end of the service, stay around for dinner, right? And when your table is ready, we'll just leave the communion elements there. Someone on the table can say, hey, let's have communion together before we jump into the meal. Is that okay? Is that okay? So stay, yeah? We've got enough tables. Okay, you just stay, stay and hang around and we'll have communion together before the din- dinner meal that we'll, we'll have later. But essentially, there is such power to remember what the Lord has done for us. Sometimes when we go about our days, when we are so busy with many things, there are so many things to which we begin to, you know, weigh us down, that we begin to consider, oh, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to do this, I need to get this done, I'm concerned about this in my family, I'm concerned about this situation. I'm bothered about what is happening here. But as we come to the Lord's table, we slow down, we pause, we remember the cross. How often do we think back about the cross? Amen? 
If you really honestly ask yourself through the day, through the week, how often do you pause and actually think about the cross? About the whip, the whipping that happened, about the rods that beat upon the back of our Lord, about the nail that pierced His hands and His feet, His blood that was shed, his sight that was open, the, the crown of thorns pressed on the temple of his head. How often do we do that? You see, that's the power of communion. That's the power of the Lord's table. That in the most natural way, as we gather together as Christians, we would pause and remember the cross. One of the things that we've had to consider is this here in Life Church that, you know, as we build community, is our community becoming social clubs? that we gather together and then we have this strong element of a social gathering of community, that will our gathering just become social? You see, that's the power of communion. So if you are meeting together with a live group or you have a community here in, in live church, then when you guys go out together as a group, can I encourage you that maybe before the meal begins, you can think about having communion together a time of remembrance of what the Lord has done on the cross for us. Amen? Amen. Because the communion naturally makes us think about the cross, about His body that's broken for us and His blood that is shed for us. Amen? Let's all stand to our feet, shall we? And we want to just commit this time to the Lord. And, you know, if, you, if you're married, if you have kids... I want to encourage you if you would respond to this message by thinking about instituting a practice of the Lord's Supper on a weekly basis in your family, right? On a weekly family. You know, do it on a Friday night, do it on a Saturday night, or whichever it is when, you know, your kids are all around. And take time, take time to pause, take time to raise your children up, your whole family up in an environment where you will constantly think about the cross and what Jesus has done on the cross for us. Amen? Amen. Now, if you're single, you know, and your family are Christians, maybe you can suggest your parents and say, hey, can we do communion weekly as part of a meal that we'll do in our homes? Yeah? Is that good? I don't know, I'm really excited about this, you know. As I think about this more and more, I get more and more excited about this. I just feel like, wow, this is, we can make this a practice in our lives. We can make this a regular practice. If you're a husband and wife, you're married, you have no kids, you can do this as well. Right? You can do this. Because I guarantee you, you might not have kids, but between husband and wives, you're going to irk each other. And when you have just a time of considering one another, pause for a while, and then you can resolve a lot of problems around the communion table. You don't have to wait till somebody blows up, right? Or if you're with other believers as you come together, for all the live groups, we encourage all our live groups to have communion each week when they meet together. You know, and I want to encourage us to do that as part of the meal. Amen. Maybe we can try. I mean, we're still going to have communion service last week of every month. We're still going to do that. Okay, we're still going to do that. But can we try to take communion out from the four walls of an order of service back into the homes, back into the meals, right? Can we take it back from being a service to being part of a meal that we have with other believers? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. And when you give us something, you give us good gifts, Lord. Father, we thank you that you never give us something lesser. When you give us something, there's always a reason. It's always for our good. Good gifts you give to us. And not just good gifts, gifts, Lord, that exceed all our expectations. Sometimes, you know, Lord, I, I just know Christmas is coming. And I'm just reminded how many times I bought things for my children. And when they opened up those presents, they looked at it sometimes with a level of disappointment. Because maybe they wanted a toy, maybe they wanted some latest gadget. But dad and mom got them something that they really, really need that will be helpful for them. Father, I pray, oh God, that we'll not be like little children, that when you give us a good gift, we'll look at it and we'll despise it and say, Lord, I don't know what this is for. 
but we would inherently understand that when you give us a good gift, it's always good. It's always essential. And, and it's going to be so, such a blessing to us beyond anything we can imagine. Father, I pray, God, that you'll help us understand that. You'll help us perceive that. And you'll help us to be hungry, Lord, to experience everything that you intended for these gifts to be. Lord, we thank you that when you instituted the bread and the cup, Lord, you set in motion something that will be a tremendous blessing in our lives. Father, I pray for my brothers, my sisters, myself included, in our families, in our gatherings, in our communities, that we'll begin to rediscover the power of remembrance, the power of introspection, the power of unity, God, the power of hope and expectation, God, that even when we come together, sometimes we're going through a difficult time, that the communion table, the Lord's table, gives us hope, Lord, for what we're going through right now in our lives, Lord. Father, we just come to you and we ask you to lead us more fully into this, Lord. Father, I pray for my brothers and my sisters that you will speak to us by your Holy Spirit, Father, I thank you, Lord, that you can go beyond what I've spoken to speak in a very direct, in a very personalized manner to every single one of us. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to do it right now because beyond just me saying it, there is a conviction of the Spirit of God that comes, that is so effective, Lord, that it's transformation, that revelation that comes, Lord, breaks the yoke, Lord, and brings us into freedom, brings us into an experience, oh God, because something has been opened up in our understanding of what you're doing in our lives, God. Father, I just pray, Lord, for my brothers and my sisters that this is what we experience, not just for them, but as a body, we'll begin to experience this, Lord. We'll begin to experience this, Lord. We'll begin to experience this. In this church, there'll be no division. In this church, oh God, will there be no segregation, oh God, by class, by race, Lord, by education, by which school we go to, Lord. Nothing of that, Lord. But there'll be such a simplicity of love for one another, Lord. Father, we pray, oh God, there'll be such an experience of healing, oh God, restoration, oh God, Lord. Because each time we look back at the cross, by faith, Lord, we can appropriate what Christ has done for us on the cross, Lord. Healing that has been purchased, wholeness, God, that has been obtained for us, Lord. Father, we pray for those things to be a reality in each of our lives, Lord. Father, we bless you. We give you praise. We give you glory, honor. We ask this all in Jesus' name. And Lord, now I want to just speak your blessings over my brothers and my sisters. The blessings of God the Father, the blessings of God the Son, and the blessings of God the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forevermore. And everybody say, Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering, shall we? Amen. Praise the Lord.